Hello everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please remember to subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. For today's case, we're doing a classic one from 1976. This is one well known in medical communities and well known in the psychiatric profession. This is one where doctors can violate your confidence. This is the case of Tarasov versus Regents of the University of California. In this case, there was a person who was mentally ill and their doctor knew they were mentally ill. The person had expressed uh, an interest in harming another party. The doctor did not do anything to advise that other party and the person did in fact cause harm. And they are suing, arguing that they should have been warned. The, the physicians argued that this was medical privilege, that they had been told this in confidence and that it was more important to be warned of this and have discussions over it rather than warn the person. So the court analyzes the competing interests and decides that actually, no, under some circumstances, a doctor must reveal your secrets in order to protect others. Let's get started with this. On October the 27th of 1969, Pozygent Podar killed Tatina Tarasov. The plants, Tatina's parents, alleged that two months earlier, Podar confided his intention to kill Tatina to Dr. Lawrence Moore, a psychologist employed by Cole Memorial Hospital at the University of California at Berkeley. They allege on Moore's request, the campus police briefly detained Podar, but released him when he appeared to be rational. They further claimed that Dr. Harvey Paulson, Moore's supporter, then directed that no further action be taken to detain Podar. No one warned of Tatiana's peril. So Tati over here, Tati over here was killed by Podar in California in 1969. So the Podar had gone to the psychiatrist and said, yeah, I'm, I want to kill this person. And at one point, the psychiatrist warned the police, but the police didn't see anything wrong and then said no further action should be taken. And then he did indeed kill her. So what relief can there be for Tati? Well, let's read some more. We shall explain that defendants therapies cannot escape liability merely because Tatiana herself was not their patient. When a therapist determines, or pursuant to the standards of his profession, should determine, that a patient presents a serious danger of violence to another, he incurs an obligation to use reasonable care to protect the intended victim against such danger. The discharge of this duty may require that the therapist take one or more various steps, depending on the nature of the case. Thus, it may call for him to warn the intended victim, or others likely to apprise the victim of the danger, to notify the police or to take what other other steps are reasonably necessary under the circumstances. The second cause of action in this lawsuit can be amended to allege that Tatiana's death approximately resulted from defendant's negligent failure to warn Tatiana or others likely to apprise her of her danger. The plaintiffs contend that as amended, such allegations of negligence and proximate causation with resulting damages can establish a cause of action. Defendants, however, contend that in the circumstances of the present case, they owe no duty to Tatiana or her parents, and in the absence of a duty, they are free to act in a careless disregard of life or safety. So the basic premise here is, for the psychiatrist, among other things, is Tatiana wasn't our patient. She's a stranger to us. And as a basic principle of law, as I'm sure that you well know, as a general principle of law, you have no particular duty to others in general. That applies whether you're police or just random person, right? So if I know of thing, if I know of a threat to you, but I didn't cause the threat, I didn't encourage the threat. Like if somehow I just come into information, let's say, let's say that somehow I hear someone planning your murder. Ooh, exciting at, at a bar or something. And they're overheard planning your murder, which doesn't sound actually that ridiculous, but let's say that's happened. It doesn't sound that ridiculous because people do stuff, stupid stuff as we've seen from FBI TR. So they're planning this and, you know, they, they show the gun or whatever they're planning. And like, I'm going there right now, or I'm going to go there tomorrow. Like if I'm just a random guy, I have no particular duty to warn you or tell the police or anyone else. Now, maybe that shouldn't be, but it's like, yeah, I'm just a rando guy. So the first thought the psychiatrists have is we don't know. We don't know a Tati. Who is a Tati? That's the first question the police have or the therapists have. Who is a Tati? We don't know. In considering the issue, we bear in mind that legal duties are not discoverable facts of nature, but merely conclusory expressions that in cases of a particular type, liability should be imposed. So what does a duty make is something that is determined at law, which I suppose it is. 
But normally you think about someone undertaking a duty. So normally someone avails themselves in some, such a way to imply a duty. Duty flows from a responsibility that flows usually from some sort of conscious action. And it's like, well, we didn't do anything, though, to absorb this duty. But we're going to, the court is going to impose it anyway. All right, so let's read that. In a landmark case, the court recognized that liability should be imposed for injury occasioned to another by his want of ordinary care or skill, as expressed in the relevant law. The court, then quoting from a different case, stated, Whenever one person is by circumstances placed in such a position with regard to another that if he did not use ordinary care and skill in his own conduct, he would cause danger to of another to the person or property of another, a duty arises to use ordinary care and skill to avoid just danger. So you do have a duty to avoid causing harm, that's for sure. And when you have a duty, if you don't use ordinary care and skill in your own conduct, and you would cause danger to the other. By your, by your not use of a, a danger, then that might be a problem. But it still implies a duty. So yeah, we depart from this fundamental principle only upon the balancing of a number of considerations. Major ones are the foreseeability of harm to the plaintiff, the degree of certainty that the plaintiff suffered injury, the closeness of the connection between the defendant's conduct and the injury suffered, the moral blame attached to the defendant's conduct, the policy of presenting further harm, the extent of burden to the defendant and consequences to the community of imposing a duty to exercise care with resulting liability for breach and the availability, cost, and prevalence of insurance for the risk involved. So the duty that applies here can only exist when we consider a whole bunch of things. So let's consider all the whole bunch of things, I guess. Although, as we've stated above, under the common law, as a general rule, one person owed no duty to the conduct of another. Right, that's pretty basic common law. No one owes a duty to anyone else unless you somehow take on that duty through some voluntary action is usually the rule here. And you don't have to warn those endangered by the conduct of others. Right, you don't have an obligation. The courts have carved out an exception to this rule in cases where the defendant stands in some special relationship to either the person whose conduct needs to be controlled or in relation to a foreseeable victim of a conduct. So if it's the person that you're working with, then yes. But if it's just some other random person, then less so. Although plaintiff's pleadings assert no special relationship between Tatiana and defendant therapist, they establish as between Podar and defendant therapist the special relationship that arises between patient and his doctor or psychotherapist. Okay, such a relationship may support affirmative duties for the benefit of third persons. Thus, for example, a hospital must exercise reasonable care to control the behavior of a patient who may endanger other persons. All right. A doctor must also warn a patient if a patient's condition or medication will render certain conduct, such as driving a car, dangerous to others. Yeah, they have to warn the patient. Yeah, they have a duty to the patient. Here's a whole bunch of things that you should not do. Yes. Right. That's fair. But then to the third party, I don't know. Although the California decisions that recognize this duty have involved cases in which defendants stood in a special relationship to both the victim and to the person whose conduct created the danger, we do not think that the duty should logically be constricted to such situations. Decisions of other jurisdictions hold that a single relationship of a doctor to his patient is sufficient to support the duty to reasonably exercise care to protect others against dangers emitting from that patient's illness. Now, of course, those other cases are dealing with biological contamination rather than psychological, so there's a big difference there. The court holds the doctor is liable to persons infected by his patient if he negligently fails to diagnose a contagious disease or having diagnosed the illness fails to warn people. So, yeah, that's fair, maybe, but because that's a contagion and you can get the disease yourself. And that's also, incidentally, why HIPAA does not apply to COVID. Amicus contends, however, that even when a therapist does in fact predict a patient poses a serious danger of violence to others, the therapist should be absolved of any responsibility for failure to act to protect the potential victim. In our view, however, once the therapist does in fact determine, or under applicable professional standards reasonably should have determined, that a patient poses a serious danger of violence to others, he bears a duty to exercise reasonable care to protect the foreseeable victim of danger. 
While the discharge of this duty of care will necessarily vary with the fact of each case, in each instance, the adequacy of therapy's conduct must be measured against the traditional negligence standard of the rendition of reasonable care under the circumstances. We recognize the public interest in supporting effective treatment of mental illness and in protecting the rights of patients to privacy and consequent public importance of safeguarding the confidential character of psychiatric communication. Against this interest, however, we must weigh the public interest in safety for violent assault. So my, my problems that I have with this language is exactly that. It's like if, if you are trying to interpret this as a reasonable actor, and you're trying to interpret this as a reasonable patient, and you're like, well, can I be secure in my confidentiality? And you're looking at this language, it's like, well, we understand it's important for confidentiality. However, we must ensure the public safety. Then it might be possible that certain people won't say anything. They won't, they won't disclose certain things. And that's a real problem. So what the court doesn't seem to fully contemplate here is that some patients may make the decision not to disclose anything at all because they'd be worried about what the disclosure would be. So the, you know, you can't disclose what you don't know. And if you don't know about it because the patient never told you, you can't disclose it. So it might prevent certain people from getting treatment. And that seems to be problematic in this language. We realize that the open and confidential character of psychotherapeutic dialogue encourages patients to express threats of violence, few of which were ever executed. So the, the court says and recognizes that this might be beneficial because maybe some people who are violent might be able to talk through their feelings of violence, and then they won't commit the violence. And very few of these will mature into a violent episode. So maybe it would be good for people to be able to talk to the therapist freely. However, the court continues. Certainly a therapist should not be encouraged routinely to reveal such threats. Such disclosures could seriously disrupt the patient's relationship with the therapist and with the person threatened. I was like, you know, the court can't really have it both ways. I don't like this language at all because the court can't have it both ways. It's like, okay, we recognize that's really important for people to be able to talk to their therapist openly and honestly. And therefore, therapists should not be encouraged to reveal these threats on a routine basis. Because if they did, it would severely disrupt the patient relationship. But they don't seem to contemplate the, the scope of their own rationale. Because from their own thing, it's like, well, if a reasonable person, not necessarily you, but if a reasonable person would, then you should. And then again, you have to think about what does reasonable look like after the fact to a jury after a lawyer has talked about this, what does reasonable look like in that situation? So if you're a therapist and you're worried about your own butt, what are you going to do in face of this language? Are you going to underdisclose or overdisclose? Something to think about. And then you also have to think about what does that mean for patients and what they're really willing to say or not. And the court doesn't seem to think about that. To the contrary, the therapist's obligation to his patient require that he not disclose a confidence unless such disclosure is necessary to avert dangers to others, and from the previous language, as will be deemed reasonable after the fact, incidentally. So you shouldn't disclose it unless it's necessary, but you should disclose it if it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. See, that's a little bit different language. And even that, he do so discreetly. So he should try to minimize this. But you have to do it reasonably, and in a fashion that will preserve the privacy of his patient to the fullest extent compatible with the preservation of threat and danger. I love this court is trying to have their cake and eat it too. And it's just not working for me. It's not just, it's just not working. It's like, you know, well, the behavior, the, the therapist, the therapist has a duty to their patient and also to third parties. And they must make sure those third parties and the general public is safe at all times. That's really important. It's more important than confidentiality. Confidentiality is a good goal, but the general public also a good goal. And so a person should behave reasonably as a reasonable person would, as is going to be judged incidentally by a jury two years after the fact, when they're looking at this coldly and the prosecutor or the, the, the person pressing the case says, how could this therapist have not known the signs were everywhere, you know? And so then, it's, and then the court tries to backtrack and say, well, they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't worry about what's reasonable. They should only do what's necessary and minimally, minimally, minimally. And they, they don't don't worry about the future lawyer saying, and that 
person didn't do what's necessary because clearly they didn't because the horrible thing happened. The court's trying to have their cake and eat it too, and I'm not buying any of this. I'm telling you that right now. Our current crowded and computerized society compels the interdependence of its members. Everyone is connected. In this risk-infected society, as opposed to like every society known in the history of mankind, which presumably was not risk-infected for some reason, we can hardly tolerate the further exposure to danger that would result from a concealed knowledge of a therapist that his patient was lethal. If the exercise of reasonable care to protect the threatened victim requires the therapist to warn the endangered party or those who can be reasonably expected to notify him, we see no sufficient societal interest that would protect and justify concealment, such as perhaps such people feeling completely free to talk to their therapist, incidentally. They, they, would, they would in no way curtail their conduct based on this. The contaminant of such risk lies in the public interest. And apparently, people with, sui people with suicidal slash murderous thoughts not being able to talk to therapists also lies in the public interest. Because any sane person who was suicidal or murderous and wanted to execute that intent wouldn't tell a therapist. So that also is in the public interest somehow. How brilliant, court. So that brings us to the end of the conclusion of Tarasov versus Regions of California. If you didn't already get the memo during my recitation of the case, I think that this is not really in the best interest because the court only is really looking at this from one side of the equation. They're looking, they're looking at this because Tarasov, Tati Tarasov herself, was murdered. And that is not good. It is not good that Tarasov, Tari, Tati Tarasov was murdered. However, in writing their decision, they say, well, if a therapist has knowledge that a person is murdered, they should tell them. And then any rational person who's having murder or suicidal thoughts who wanted to execute on that intention would not tell a therapist because they would be able to read. So it inhibits people who might need help in their most trying times from getting help. So a, a rational person who is nevertheless suicidal might choose to forego treatment because their autonomy is more important than the treatment. And they never seem to contemplate this policy. This is amazing to me. They can't, they can't see, it's like, well, you know, this will have no negative repercussions. I'm like, it might have some negative repercussions. But at least for a moment, that is the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.